intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Hello, this is Marina Sprocky Spriggs, and I am your host of Always Another Way podcast. I have a master's in professional counseling. I'm the Ippy Award-winning author of Stop Looking for a Husband, Find the Love of Your Life, and Nasty Divorce, A Kid's Eye View. I write positive divorce advice for the Huff Post, and I'm trained in clinical hypnosis. And this podcast speaks to out-of-the-box thinkers, and it's for those who hear the call of hope and always another way. And if you're very rigid and set in your beliefs, then this might not be your cup of tea. However, you should note, taste can and do change. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Always Another Way. And we've moved to the Always Another Way podcast Facebook page if you want to catch us live there. And as always, on all the podcast apps and iTunes. And the best way to get it is to subscribe and rate and tell your friends because the more people that know, the more people that can hear how to do things another way. And today, we're going to talk about modern day philosophy and uncomfortable topics. And I actually added the uncomfortable topics on the end of this just recently because it's related. And whether or not you know me personally, I can tell you this. I've always been someone who's outgoing and just loves to reach out to people. I see people for whatever reason that I think they're interesting in some way, and I just, like I gravitate toward them and I reach out to them. And um, probably there are some of you listening that are friends with me because of that, because I saw something that you did and I reached out to you and then we became friends that way. And... Um, So I reach out to people again, usually for their work or something interesting. And my guest today is one of those people. So there's this um, website, Medium. It's a publishing platform. Uh, Lots of great stuff to read on there. I love to read. I write. So, you know, here we are. So I get an email from them. And um, one of the titles, you know, it suggests like things you might like grab my attention. So I start reading this article and, you know, didn't even look to see who the author is. I'm just like, I like the title, reading, it's interesting, keep reading. And that's how I found my next guest. So um, my next guest dropped out of a PhD program in philosophy after six years. And I want to read to you before I bring her on the part that really grabbed me. Um, She says, I will never forget sitting in our auditorium listening to a long talk about metaethics, when right outside the doors of the university, Black Lives Matter activists were marching, and this was in St. Louis at the time of Ferguson. I could hear them chanting, the stark contrast between the esoteric subtleties of metaethics versus the concrete realities of what would be considered applied ethics, a term usually uttered with slight contempt, made me deeply uncomfortable. How could I justify this exuberance of abstraction when there were so many real world problems that needed the minds of intelligent people. Uh, So yeah, whoa, that like, I like to dive deep. That spoke to me about real things. So like, yeah, why don't we talk about this more? So as I go to, you know, find Rachel, you just, I happen to notice something, she's transgender. And then I start thinking, and this all kind of went together, that there are some people that if they had known this, Maybe they wouldn't read the article or even give her the credit for her academics. And she is very, very smart. So why, as humans, do we treat other humans as if they're less than for any reason? 
and it really blows my mind. And it's been blowing my mind since I was a child and could see this like humans, mostly adult humans at the time, that I almost called them like the people that come in and just like vomit on a party with their hate, their whatever, that they're got their knickers in a twist about and come and just barf on somebody else that's not even doing anything. And, you know, then in the culture at large, so we're not here to talk about politics or popular talk topics, but, you know, you know if you've been around in the United States or even if not, what is going on in our politics and then the Roseanne Barr thing recently and racism and school shootings and, 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 and you know, and then I just think, well, certainly there is no higher power that claims itself to be love that would hate someone for existing. So when these like religious arguments come out also like blows my mind, I guess seething with hypocrisy. And, um, and I know these things are not, they're uncomfortable and they're not fun to talk about, but that's because the life that most of us, like me and a lot of you listening exist, is, you know, not that we don't have struggles and stuff, but we don't get hated on for existing, meaning like your existence is threatened. And there's millions of people, by the way, that are hated on for existing, meaning because of their skin color, their gender identity, their sexual orientation, their religion, their economic status there. You can name a whole bunch of things, disability, um, you know, and to just start from the gate being hated is crazy. So I invite you to open up your mind and look at things another way. And maybe if we could, like I just read this email, just words on a page from another human that wrote them, kind of, you know, see that we're all connected. So anyways, I want to bring on my next guest, Rachel Ann Williams is an author, writer, and ex-academic philosopher. She has a master's degree in philosophy from LSU and spent six years in Washington University in St. Louis's philosophy neuroscience psychology program before ultimately dropping out. She started her gender transition at 28 years old and is now 31. She grew up in Orlando, Florida and currently lives in St. Louis, Missouri. And welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. And that was such a great introduction. It really got my mind going. So there's like a million directions. Um, so I'm really excited to have this discussion today. Cool. Well, let's, let's jump into one of them. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've got something on the top of your head just from what I said, or if we want to start with that, that little piece of your article that I just read about like, okay, you're sitting here, you know, with you know, highly intelligent people philosophizing <laughs> and, uh, you know, and outside there's another kind of philosophizing going on. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I want to start with that in regards to the, the reactions I got to that piece I wrote on Medium because I'm still friends with a lot of professional philosophers. I got a lot of comments and pushback from philosophers, people who engage in this. This is their livelihood, their profession, it's their whole life, their being. They're very defensive of the institution of academic philosophy for obvious reasons. And I do kind of want to get into the cold, hard pragmatics of people defending their professional turf because this is how they make money, this is how they put food on the table. And that's kind of a discussion that's not often talked about because philosophy is generally speaking considered to be, oh, you, you're into philosophy because you love the truth, just the pure truth. Let's just go after the truth. We have no utilitarian, pragmatic motives. We're not motivated by money. We're not motivated by power or influence. We don't want to be famous. All we want to do is just like hide in a basement somewhere, reading the library stacks and pursuing truth. And it's kind of like the stereotype of philosophers. Um, and so the pushback I got from the piece was basically along those lines, like, hey, like, you know, we're doing important work here. You know, we're seeking the truth. Isn't that important? You know, so 
Um, and the search for truth can take all kinds of intellectual abstractions, you know, physics or mathematics or computer science. A lot of these fields can be very abstract. So they defended abstraction. Um, but I think it goes much further than that. Um, so that's kind of where I would jump off is kind of that intersection between like the pursuit for truth and how that often looks very abstract, but then kind of like the subtle pragmatic realities of what it means to be in an academic institution. All right. Well, let's go there. So kind of, you know, start, start with one of those. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, the first thing I kind of want to say is like, when I was sitting in that lecture hall, listening to that talk on metaethics, this was a recently renovated building. It's Wash U. It's a private institution. They have a $7 billion endowment, tons of money is coming into this institution. I mean, that building got recently renovated for millions of dollars. And it's like, on the other hand, we have these Black Lives Matters activists and they're struggling and they're fighting against police brutality, which in itself is just a kind of like, a small little, pro not little problem, it's a huge problem, but it's like, it represents the entire history of injustice of people who were brought to this country enslaved against their will. They're fighting economic injustice, the leftover of Jim Crow, subtle implicit biases, racism, police brutality. And then the whole history of St. Louis itself, if you know anything about the history, it's one of the most highly segregated cities in America. So there's like issues with like taxation and, um, you know, what's the tax base, the county where the, usually the rich white people are in the county. And then you have the people of marginalization in the city. So there's all sorts of history politics. And I'm sitting here thinking like, why am I sitting in this building that was like, you know, we're in this nice air conditioning building, you know, people are getting paid salaries over a hundred thousand dollars. And why are they being paid this, this money? First of all, they're teaching students, which I totally believe I talked about in the article. It's an important thing to teach students how to think well. Um, in our societies today, we need people who are critical thinkers, who you know how to like look at complex information and analyze it and kind of like put some logic on there and chop it around. And that's a really important skill. And I really do believe in the value of philosophy. That's why I still, identify as a philosopher. That's why I still engage in writing about philosophical topics, but there's a certain like disconnect for me as far as the fact that these people are not just paid to teach students how to think well, they're also paid to produce papers, research papers. And most philosophers, if you talk to them, they say that that's their primary thing they care about is their research. That's why, you know, they get hired based on the research. They get hired by how many research papers they publish. So it's ostensibly about the research. And that's the quest for truth, this philosophical project that's been going on for a long time. But if you look at how these publications are being made, nobody is reading them. They're behind academic paywalls. Um, you know, so there's these big companies that own all these journals and they restrict access. So normal people do not have access to these journals. Yes. So, I, I know this to um, be true. I've tried to look up stuff for research, scholarly article behind the paid wall. And there are little tricks to get around it. So you can like email the author for like a PDF, or you can maybe find like a preprint copy somewhere on a website. But generally speaking, the actual product that, you know, that's the result of like the copy editors, the publication, the journal itself, all that stuff is hidden. So the public doesn't have access to it. And the philosophers will turn around and say like, oh, well, this is normal in other academic fields, such as like, you know, science and stuff. But the thing about scientists, they need those technical journals because science involves technical details as far as like how to create experiments. And I think it's not so clear to me, or at least it's not obvious to me that philosophy needs to rely on its kind of like inner circle of, um, only speaking to themselves because the philosophy that I always resonated with was the philosophy that was easy to read, 
it was understandable by anyone. And, um, you know, it's not to say that like, you know, my grandpa could like read some like philosophy article, but it's, that's at least should be a standard we strive for. But if you look at how philosophy is actually written, the, it looks like they're actually striving to make it more inaccessible, to put more jargon, more technical details, to make it more inaccessible. And that's taken to be a good thing. And I think that's like such a sad tragedy that we have all these really smart people and they're being indoctrinated to write in such a way that is in inaccessible. Um, and I just think we're wasting resources because we're paying these people's salaries. We're paying for these um, graduate training programs. We're paying for the, the the, the fellowships, the, the teaching scholarships, we're paying for all this training and we're training them to write things that are inaccessible. And, but philosophy matters to us all, you know, and that comes back to the Black Lives Matters activists. You know, it's about ethics. It's about figuring out what we should do as a society, what our values are, how do we think about values? How do we if you have a society of different values, um, how do you kind of navigate that? And philosophy has useful things to say, but you know, it's the only people who get out there to the public are the big shots who've been around for 30 years and then they start writing articles in the New York Times and it's like they get access to the public, but all like the junior scholars, the graduate students, they have to toil away for years and years and years writing these obscure papers that no one reads and and the whole and <laughs> that's so that's kind of like where I was thinking about with the, the um, that talk in particular. But there's a million other reasons why I left. There's a million problems with the institution. Um, uh, yeah, let's talk. And one of the things you mentioned on there was also the overwhelming white male presence in philosophy and it was like uh, some high number percentage yeah no if you for 90 percent. if you look at the the look if you go back the past like a hundred years of modern contemporary philosophy and you look at all the papers that are the most widely cited so these are the papers everyone's commenting on and then the commenters are commenting on the commenters so all these central papers the vast majority of them, something like 97%, were all written by um, uh, white, straight, cis, um, and cis, for those who don't know, means non-trans, so someone who has a, I guess, a quote-unquote normal gender identity, just, um, you know, so these are all written by people who have a lot of you know, privilege in our society. It's not to say they don't have problems, but they have a certain like head start. Um, and also if you go back to the history of philosophy, most of the great philosophers that you read about, if you, so if you just take a philosophy 101 class, you look through the, the syllabus, 99% of all syllabi across philosophy 101s all across the country are all gonna have the same authors and they're all usually like white men. Um, and so you don't even start seeing women being represented in the syllabi until like the 20th century. So that's like literally thousands of years of philosophy being done with no women. And so imagine you're a first year freshman, you know, a woman and you're interested in philosophy. Maybe you read a book or you heard a lecture or something and it kind of sparked your interest. So then you start going into this field and it's like, you look around you at all these men it's being taught by men there's like there's like men taking the classes you're reading about men the people commenting on the men are also other men you notice sort of subtle things um about like power dynamics in departments like um you know who's raising their hand the most who's getting called on the most who's dominating the discussions, um, you know, so it's all these like subtle little cues about who has influence in academic philosophy. And then you look at the rates of gender representation and you would think fields that are like stereotypically male, like computer science or, or like, you know, biology or like the STEM science fields, you'd think they, they would have the worst representation as far as women. 
but actually philosophy has the worst gender ratio of almost any academic institution, including computer science. Wow. So, so it's like, it's really bad. And it's, um, and I can't tell you, if you, you can go online and read anonymous philosophy blogs where like people in the discipline post their anonymous thoughts and it's brutal. There's some nasty stuff being said out there. And this is, you know, if you're a woman in philosophy, you start reading these anonymous blogs and you know, people, it's, you know, they'll say, they'll say things like women aren't cut out for it. They'll say women are too emotional. Um, and that's the stereotype going back to like, um, philosophers for thousands of years have always thought about men are the rational creatures and women are the emotional creatures. Women take care of children and men think about difficult, complex problems. And so like, obviously philosophy is like better suited for men and women are better suited for like caretaking or maybe they can do ethics because ethics is about taking care of people or something. But if you want to do like metaphysics or epistemology or hard thinking logic like you better be a man otherwise you're going to be facing so many like battles people will question your intelligence and so and then you throw the transgender thing in there and it like adds a whole other layer of like assumptions and expectations and um, and so it's really, it's not a great place for women to be. And I really admire the women who are in there who are persistent, but I'm friends with a lot of women in philosophy, um, on Facebook. And I still kind of follow the field a little bit and they're continuously complaining to me about the state of the field in regards to sexual harassment, like subtle little, um, you know, we're living in the me too generation and of the Me Too movement and philosophy has had so many Me Too moments. We've had our own Harvey Weinsteins. We've had our own, like, you know, people falling from power, men, powerful men after decades of patterns of harassment that were swept under the rug by departments, by ignored by colleagues, you know, um, defended and rationalized as just being one of the boys. And it's like this pattern has been going on for a long time. And it's very hard to fight because the men are the ones who have the power. They're the head of the department. So they're the ones who have access to the, they're the editors of the journals, the most powerful journals. They're the ones in charge of the graduate programs. They're on the hiring committees. They're on, the, the advisors train the graduate students. And also they're behind the scenes at the pub talking gossip. They're behind the scenes, you know, chit chatting and like spreading these, I mean, it, it's insidious. It's not just on the surface level, it's behind the scenes, it's politics, it's gossip. It's the way, as someone who's transitioned, one of the interesting things is I've been around, I've been in groups of men and men say things to other men that they would never say in front of a woman. And likewise, women say things to other women that they would never say in the presence of men. And as someone who's been on both sides of that gender divide, I've seen both of those sides. And the things men talk about sometimes is like frightening and it's eye-opening. And a lot of it is, um, so yeah, <laughs> it's, oh gosh, you got me started up here, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's good because it, it is just all related, even that. And then the thing you bring up about also how some people keep their power because they've got like status and money and other things. And, um, and, and I talk about toxic people a lot, uh, having grown up with an authoritarian parent and then just witnessed toxicity, even in an abusive relationship of how and, and women can be too. So we're not just totally going to pin it all on men, but in this particular case, uh, philosophy in general, the more men in there and what goes on. But it's, it is, uh, you know, so, oh, sorry, I was missed up. I was circling back on that. Um, what everybody does is just, okay, well, because they have this or because they have that, we can just ignore this like big pimple <laughs> of really, really bad behavior because of a few other things. And um, it's unfortunate, but I do believe that the tide is turning and that the more people that feel empowered to speak up about unfairness like this and that you cannot run over people, you cannot railroad people, you cannot manipulate like that, yeah, the, the, more, sure. the more that gets spoke up, you know, only behooves us all. 
Yes, and I do think you're right that the tide is turning, um, but I always kind of liken it to like a cruise ship, you know, it's like a cruise ship can't just turn on a dime. It's got all this momentum, all this inertia, and it takes a long, if you've ever been on a big ship like that, it takes a long time for them to turn around. And it's like, yeah. and then kind of like, um, you know, even within that turning process, it's one of those one step forwards, two steps backwards, you're going to have that phenomenon on all kinds of front. It's like, you, we kind of like thought we we're maybe making society like progress has a progressive society and then some major political thing happens and it's like, oh, like, looks like we didn't make much progress. And it's like, it's kind of easy to lose like sight of the larger progress we're making as a whole, I think because we're so, we often get tied up in our own like micro battles or, you know, local battles, either, either on the city level or in our lives or in our relationships or at the workplace. So it's very easy to like, not get a sense that things are changing for the better. But I also think it would be incredibly naive to think that people aren't resistant to this change process. People want to hold on to the old way of doing things. And you kind of mentioned in your introduction about like, um, this kind of ties back to, um, you know, people who are different and like why people are hated just for their existence. And, you know, uh, so a lot of people want to hold on to the old order. The Pope, for example, has um, likened in public statements many times that trans people are, clen are akin to nuclear bombs hmm. because we challenge the order of male and female that is imposed onto the human species by the natural law, by the order given to us by God. And a lot of people like to believe that some things are immutable. Some people are very attracted to the idea that some things are set in stone for all eternity. And perhaps one of those things is the gender divide. Men are like this and women are like this. And that's just the way things are. And it's very a natural, intuitive idea. It's been around for a long time. And people are very like reluctant to change that idea. And they're reluctant to view things in terms of an evolutionary process, a change, a progress, a, a alteration. They want to hold on to this idea of immutable change, change or like without change, you know, change um, is like an illusion. And so we're kind of, so, so there is, there are people who are resistant to this process of progress. And I think we have to like learn to speak in a way that is sympathetic to their ears um, because, yeah. you know, these people have very strongly held values, very strongly held belief systems. And I think um, those of us who do want to see society change in more progressive directions, like we have to like take that into account. Otherwise we're just going to be like yelling past each other and just thumping our fists on the table. And that's never productive. Oh, yeah, you are so right on that. And that, that is true. We are all, I mean, all of us for different things. And I think it's a lot fear-based and ignorance. Um, and not like dumb ignorance, but just like ignorance I don't know. There's a lot of things I don't know I don't even know, you know. But yeah. um, that I, holding on to or just even like, you know, f if you don't see something off enough, I do not personally know anybody that's transgender. I know people that are gay, but you know, as you're younger, you meet people and then you're like, oh, okay, just a person. Or if you're, I'm white and you grow up with all white people and you see like one or two black people or like one Asian person, you can't help but just like not know what you don't know until you realize, hey, wait, they're just people. And I'm just not, it's just not familiar to me. Like if you're always eating McDonald's and somebody takes you somewhere high rent sushi, that might be weird, you know. But. Yeah, and, and this is actually one of the difficulties with the transgender movement as like a movement that's trying to um, approximate the civil rights movements that have occurred for other marginalized populations, like, you know, people of color or, you know, gay people, because people of color or, you know, African Americans and um, their makeup, last statistic I saw is like 12% of the population. Gay people could be upwards of 10%, whereas like trans people are like 
Some estimates I've seen have put us at less than 1% of the population are transgender in some way. And it's like, if you track like the history of um, gay acceptance in America, it correlates strongly with answers to the survey question of, do you personally know a gay person? Mm -hmm. But because trans people are 1%, you could go a long time without knowing a, a transgender person. So it's like, and that sort of like personal, like knowledge, like you mentioned, is so important. Like this is what the example I always find funny. It's like politicians who, you know, are publicly against some like social progress thing, and then like suddenly their their daughter comes out as gay, and it's like, oh, I'm all for gay rights, and it's like, well, of course you are because you you saw the humanity. You already thought of that person as a human with the complex lives who deserves love and. Yeah. You know, and it's like, but it's like, of course you see them, see their humanity, but it's like, um, and, and this is why little things like employment discrimination are so important for trans people, because the more we get out there into the workplace, the more we're just seen as part of like, oh, like that's, there's a trans person working at Starbucks. Like I worked at Starbucks for a year. Mm -hmm. um, right after I dropped out of my PhD program, I worked at Starbucks for a year, just trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I probably made more of a difference working at Starbucks, just like getting like these hundreds and thousands of people interacting with me on a daily basis, getting to know me. I knew all the regulars, I knew their names, they knew me. It's like, and you know, some people would ask me questions, but most people just like got to know me as a normal barista and just, I'm just here to serve you coffee. I'm good at my job. I know you drink, like, let me help you. And it's like that kind of like, normal, boring, mundane representation is exactly the type of representation we need. Whereas like people who maybe not don't know anyone trans, they just go on the media and it's like, oh, Caitlyn Jenner said some crazy thing. And it's like, you see these like celebrity representations, or you see like the drama happening on the global political scale, but until you see it on the local scale, progress will never happen. Um, and that's why it's going to be hard for us because we are such a small percentage of the population. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine like just that of being that of a 2% of just being something different about yourself. I mean, and you're, and you're white too, you know? And yeah. so, uh, you know, but just to have that going on, it just, I can't imagine it. And what is just what is the, I guess, what do you want people to know? What is the hardest part? Because you are so right. We are all humans and for people to see, and there's a lot of rhetoric that, you know, that goes around that tends to dehumanize people, lump them into groups and, you know, all the ways you do that. But what? the truth is, is to, to bring humanity to all the human beings on this earth that we all inhabit. Well, I think the biggest takeaway I would want people to know about trans people is exactly what you just said, which we need to learn how to de-group people. In other words, we need to learn to see people as unique individuals because trans people are one of the most diverse populations on the planet. There's not a lot of common between trans people other than the fact that they are trans. Um, you know, so they start trying to like exercise our minds so that we get into the practice of like not thinking in terms of black and white, not thinking in terms of group thinking, not thinking in terms of, oh, that trans person, such a typical trans person. There's no such thing as a typical trans person. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was trying to say like, oh, trans people who are attracted to women are different from trans people attracted to men or trans people who transition when they're 60 years old are different from trans people who transition from their five years old. Every single trans person on the entire planet has a unique history, a unique life experience. They didn't all transition for the same reason. They don't all believe the same things. And, but this lesson it's not just true of trans people, it's true of everybody. That's the thing about, yes. um, but in our culture and in in the way we do science, it's all about averages. It's like, oh, the scientists look at the averages of this group compared to the averages of this group. So we think about averages and groups and tendencies and populations, but we ignore 
individual differences. That's one of the things I learned in, in my neuroscience studies is that the neurosciences are starting to have the power to understand and grapple with the complexity of individuality. Um, and looking at, so rather than looking at science in terms of these averages, starting to think of science in terms of a, a case study and looking at the case study versus the average will tell you so much more interesting things about that person. So that's what I would take away is like, don't look at my experience because like, I have a lot of privilege, you know, like not all trans people look like me, not all trans people sound like me, not all trans people are as educated as I am. Um, so it's like, but that's true of like everybody. <laughs> so it's like, right. Um, um, so it's like everyone has their own story to tell. And that's what I would say. You know what, Rachel, like I could talk to you all day long. I mean, like so interesting and another smarty at the party. And so if we, um, if everybody wanted to, I know you've got a book coming out and some other things, let's tell everybody where they can find you at, like from every place they can talk to you, hear more about you, all that stuff. Okay, so my blog is transphilosopher.com, easy to find. Um, I'm not posting as much on there, so I am on Medium. So if you just look, if you go on Google, Medium, Rachel Williams, um, I'm sure you can find me. Um, I'm on Twitter. Twitter is a great place to find me. My handle is transphilosopher, but drop the E at the end. So it's just like transphilosopher, but then drop the E at the end. Um, uh, and that's probably the best way. Um, my email is on my website. Um, I'm very open, like I'm pretty easy to find on Google. So if you just Google Rachel Ann Williams, philosopher, trans philosopher, whatever, you can probably find me. Um, so, and I have a book coming out. We're still finalizing the title, but it's going to be with Jessica Kingsley Publishers. It's going to be a collection of 40 short essays and they all originated from my blog. Um, so they're going to be on trans feminism. It's usually to my life, kind of memoir, feminism, essays. It's going to be good stuff. I'm really excited. It's going to be my first published book. Um, so stay tuned for more details. Well, congratulations. And I so related to you. So I just love what you pushed out. And Rachel is a modern day philosopher. That is for sure. So check her out. And also, you know, people are people, are people, are people, and we're all different, we're all unique, we're all connected, and there is always another way.